Hello. Good morning to you all, or good evening for the rest of you. We are not either in Hong Kong or Sao Paulo. We are around the world by the internet. Uh, we are here for the webinar, uh, talking about Brazil, a set of arbitration, uh, which are, what are the, the future perspectives, if there are any. Uh, we have a serious problem with this pandemic around the world, but we all know that uh, the work doesn't stop. Uh, we have a lot to do, we have a lot to learn. And the idea of this webinar is exactly talking about arbitration and arbitration Brazil, where we are uh, and where we expect to be. Well, we have with us, I'm Carlos Schwabs, I'm the former president, president of Kansas CBC, uh, and I'll be the, your host for this morning uh, evening. Uh, here with us, we have Maria Claudia Prokopiaki. She is an internationally recognized arbitration expert living in London, where she sits as arbitrator in a wide variety of international arbitration matters under all major institutional and ad hoc arbitral rules. Uh, also with us, we have Luisa Como. She is the Deputy Secretary General of Kansas CBC a fellow of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators, and she has experience as consul and case manager in domestic and international arbitration. Uh, ah, it's important to say, Luisa Comel is organized the Sao Paulo the Hanseatic Free Moots uh, and has been keen participant in arbitration and mediation competition. Also, uh, Pedro Martini, who is a, an associate of Cleary Gossably, and is a practice in Brazil and in New York, uh, and holds an LLM from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, the idea is to talk about Brazil, and for that we have to, we, we, we divide the, the, the program into main, in, in four main topics. First, we're gonna talk about the Brazilian Arbitration Act, uh, then we're going to think a little bit about resilient courts and arbitration. We have to talk about international arbitration in Brazil, I'm sorry, institutional arbitration in Brazil, and what respects the resilient arbitration and its future. Uh, for that, I'm going to start with one question. I will direct this question for one of the guests. Uh, the other guests will be invited to comment to put some comments on the answer. And I hope this will be great. I think we all learn a little bit more about Brazil arbitration in Brazil and how we're going to deal with the pandemic time and how we're going to deal with the arbitration in the future. Oh, uh, let's start with Luisa. Luisa. Uh, we have to talk about the first issue, the Brazilian Arbitration Act. Uh, I think everybody knows about that, but uh, someone told me that the Brazilian Arbitration Act uh, seems like the trial model law. That's true. There are some difference. They are the same. Please explain us, uh, introduce us to the wonderful world of the Brazilian Arbitration Act. Thank you, Carlos, for the kind introduction. I will get to your question. But first of all, good evening to everyone. And I say evening because despite this being a virtual gathering, let's just assume that we're all in Hong Kong, even though it's neither Vindabona, neither the city where respondent has this place of business. Uh, on a more personal note, I have to say that I'm very excited to be with you today. Uh, four years ago, Carlos and myself had the amazing opportunity to come to Hong Kong and to take part in the VEs East for the first time. It was during the 24th business when the Kansas CBC rules were applied to the case, the airplane parks case. And it was lovely. It was a very unique experience. It was very different from the Vienna experience. And hopefully next year, it, we, we can all do this in person. And I strongly encourage you all participants who 
well, if you're not going to be able to be a Moody next year or compete anymore, then I strongly encourage that you participate at least as arbitrators because it's, again, it's a fantastic experience. Um, now moving to, I'll, I'll make some introductions before answering Carlos' questions. Uh, when you talk about uh, arbitration and seat of arbitration, which is what we're here to discuss today, uh, the, the cliche phrase also goes, so location, location, location. And uh, I've actually researched what Gary Bourne has to say because I wanted to bring uh, a, an author that is closer to you. And Gary Bourne himself explains that the seat of arbitration has recently lost some of its importance in relation to past international arbitration cases. So for instance, when Carlos had his first arbitration, international arbitration case, uh, which he already explain to me well he can tell you the, the whole story but it was in London it was seated in London and what that meant at the time was that also the hearings and everything was done in London and nowadays this does not go necessarily so the importance for us lawyers or law students the importance of the seat of arbitration it's a lot more it goes beyond that and specifically the legal Aspect. So the, the legal implications in having the seat of arbitration, whether that is Sao Paulo or any, any other city in the world or country for that matter. And Gary Bourne lists a number of reasons why the, the location of the arbitral seat can have critical importance. And I mean, I'm introducing these aspects because when I, when I tell you how Sao Paulo works and how the American Arbitration Act works, then you can pay attention if we do have all of those points throughout this presentation. And those reasons are that, uh, that Gary Bourne mentions. And they, the, he says that it, even though it has diminished the importance of the actual seat over the years, nonetheless, it remains a potentially decisive significance. And some of the aspects we have to bear in mind are, first, contract, whether it's a contracting state under the New York Convention, Second, supportive national arbitration regime. Third, standards for annulment of arbitral awards for effects on selection of arbitrators. Five, effects on choice of procedural and substantive laws. Availability of judicial assistance, neutrality of arbitral seat, convenience and cost, and last, language of arbitration. So if you take those considerations as for the seat, now why Sao Paulo? In order to give you an idea of how relevant Sao Paulo is as a seat, um, and probably Maria Claudia will explain that in much more detail later on, uh, I will refer to the Queen Mary International Arbitration Survey 2018. And in that international survey, well, Latin America reported a striking popularity of Sao Paulo, which took fourth place in the region and also came eighth in the overall ranking. So, Rio de Janeiro, which is also in Brazil, as you know, in the global ranking of seats. Um, so Rio de Janeiro came 14th in the global ranking of seats and eighth in Latin America as a subgroup. Just so you have a comparison, Miami in comparison to Sao Paulo and, and Rio de Janeiro ranked 12th of, in the global ranking and seventh as the most preferred seat in the Latin American subgroup. This, uh, I'm mentioning this specifically because throughout the presentation, I will dis we will discuss much more about Sao Paulo, which is here in Brazil, as Carlo, Carlos likes to say, where business happens, where everything happens. And Rio de Janeiro is more of a touristic and lovely city. Well, a lot of business still happens in Rio de Janeiro, but not as much as Sao Paulo. Uh, but we recently, just a few years, a couple of years ago, we opened another Rio de Janeiro due to the increasing number of cases in Rio. And Rio is particularly interesting because it poses uh, an alternative to Sao Paulo. And it's specifically important for, such, for, for uh, specific sectors. So um, oil and gas disputes, electric energy disputes, and maritime arbitration as well. And what, what, what I mean to say this is both in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, I mean, Brazil as a whole, 
we have seen an, a rise in the number of cases in the past decade, decade. So that if you think about it for the past 10 years, and if you look at a graphic, it would look like something like this. So yes, arbitration is something that has been increasing in Brazil and has uh, been becoming much more popular over the, over the past few years. But now going to specifically what Carlos asked. Uh, first, it's important to mention that Brazil is signatory to the New York Convention. So you all know what that means and those implications. So that is very important fact that you, sh you should bear in mind. And then the Brazilian Arbitration Act. Well, the Brazilian Arbitration Act was enacted in 1996. It did not adopt the UNCTRA model law, but it was certainly inspired by it. So those of you who are familiar with the UNCTRA model law, and I'm hoping here that most of you are familiar by now with the UNCTRA model law, it should not be difficult to understand the characteristics of the Brazilian Arbitration Act because the main aspects are the same. So the Brazilian Arbitration Act is, well, historically they say that it's part, part, partially based on the UNCTRA model law as well as the 1988 Spanish Arbitration Act. But in, with regards to the main points, so the, the main interesting things that we have to discuss, um, one of them being that arbitration clauses become binding. So that is by far the most important thing for us in, arbitrate, in, in arbitration, either for arbitrators, lawyers, or for parties. So arbitration clauses do become binding. Uh, the respect to, the, to the principle of party autonomy and both to applicable law and procedural rules. The principle of separability of the arbitration agreement, that is also a very important aspect where it's similar both in the Brazilian Arbitration Act and the UNCTRA trauma model law. The, the principle of competence, competence, which is also enshrined in the Brazilian Arbitration Act. So uh, it is up to the arbitrators to decide on their own jurisdiction. Uh, last but not least, very similarities though, arbitral awards do become binding at the end. So that is also a very important fact for arbitration because otherwise we're just wasting our time if arbitral awards at the end don't become binding. But the differences, uh, and, and those are a few, few differences, uh, are such as, well, first, the model law applies to international commercial arbitration, while the Brazilian Arbitration Act regulates both domestic and international proceedings. It does not differentiate domestic and international arbitration proceedings. And another difference is that under the model law, unless uh, it's, just, it's a very subtle difference, but in, under the model law, the date in which the parties uh, request, so the, the date of the request for arbitration is deemed to be the date of the commencement of arbitration. And under the Brazilian Arbitration Act, the commencement of arbitrator, the, the, the commencement of the arbitration only happens when the arbitrators, whether the sole arbitrator or the, the three-person tribunal, when they accept their appointments. So that is a very subtle difference, but it's also one of those um, differences that is there. And last but not least, what, what else do I have to say? Well, I was just gonna say that uh, Brazilian law only differs foreign domestic awards based on the place where they were rendered. So this territorial approach has been recognized in decisions rendered by, by su the Superior Court of Justice. I don't know if Pedro might get into that later, so I'll just skip it. But the Brazilian Arbitration Act of 1996 was recently amended in 2015. And some of those important changes brought by this amendment were the creation of an arbitral letter, which is an instrument designed for effective communication between arbitral tribunal and judiciary, and uh, a provision regarding public administration. So even though arbitration proceedings with state and state entities had were already taking place well before the 2015 amendments to the Arbitration Act, it was important. It was an important milestone, and over the previous uh, five years, we have noticed a significant increase in the use of arbitration with those state entities. Um, so I guess that's it, Carlos. I guess those were my, my first thoughts on UNCTRAL. And... Thank you very much. It was a wonderful introduction.
for the Brazilian Arbitration Board. Uh, and in the end of your presentation, you will answer my question. So I thank you very much for that. Uh, if any, uh, uh, any of the particip participants has any question, I think we have an QA here. You can direct your question, and our uh, people taking care of that will send to me to make uh, the questions to the, uh, the lecture. Uh, uh, Maria Claudia, Pedro, do you have uh, any comments on the brilliant presentation of Luisa? Not for now. Pedro, no? I, I think my my um, subsequent presentation may address some of the points that Louisa made, so I'll take that. So uh, I will start with that because Louisa made the introduction <laughs> of uh, Brazil as of arbitration, explaining the difference between the Brazilian <laughs> Arbitration Act and the model law. But now we have to learn a little bit about the courts and how the courts in Brazil uh, looks to the arbitration. If uh, there is any kind of intervenience, if uh, there is any kind of cooperation. So if you can deal with that, it would be a wonderful time to learn about. Sure, thank you, Carlos. Um, just before I start, I'd like to thank the um, Comms CBC for the opportunity to speak here today and very briefly congratulate all the teams participating in the VEC Smooth who have been working very hard over the past months despite the adverse circumstances that we have been facing over the last year or so. So congratulations to all and thank you for taking the time to hear us. So um, Carlos, first, uh, let, me, let me answer your question um, more directly and then I'll uh, expand on a little bit on, on that answer. So overall, uh, in my view, Brazilian courts are quite supportive of arbitration. So that's the, the bottom line here, I think. Courts have been generally respectful of the competence, competence principle and have also been assisting parties and tribunals alike in making arbitration a more effective means of dispute resolution in Brazil. Um, for the benefit of those that are not very familiar with our judicial system, in Brazil, arbitration related issues would usually be submitted to local trial and appeal courts. So for example, if the seat of arbitration is the city of Sao Paulo, then the trial courts of the city of Sao Paulo would have jurisdiction over arbitration related issues. And accordingly, the appeal courts of the state of Sao Paulo would have jurisdiction as well. Above, above these two lower courts um, layers, we find the Superior Court of Justice, what we call the STJ, and the Supreme Court of Justice, the SDF. Um, since the SDJ is the main court responsible for the uniform application of the law, it is at this level, at the SDJ, the Superior Court of Justice, that we see the development of the most important case law related to arbitration. So local and, and appeal courts um, have been more and more qualified and they have been handling very well, highly complex arbitration issues. In particular, in Sao Paulo, for example, the local judiciary has implemented uh, the notion of specialized courts on both levels, trial and appeal courts to address issues related to arbitration. So this is, this is a very important point because it allows the courts to build their expertise on arbitration related matters and to ensure more consistent decisions because the decisions are all going through the same specialized courts um, at least in, in that region, in Sao Paulo. We do know the, uh, that other regions are also trying to opt for that structure of specialized courts. And we hope that happens across the country because we have been seeing uh, very good development in Sao Paulo since that um, has happened. On its turn, uh, the SDJ has been performing its role quite well as well. Um, the SCJ ensures that the Brazilian arbitration law is properly observed and that it's applied consistently throughout the country. So not only they, they look not only at decisions from Sao Paulo, but decisions from um, all the other 26 um, regions. 
um, of course, this is a subject that can be discussed at length, right? The, um, the relationship between courts and arbitration, you can spend the whole afternoon with that. But given, given our time today, given our limitation here, I'd like to briefly mention two interesting, let's say recent developments. So developments of the last five years or so. The first one is the one that Luisa just mentioned, the so-called arbitral ladder which was adopted in the 2015 amendment of the Brazilian arbitration law. In simple terms, the arbitral ladder works like a rogatory ladder, for example, that is used in cross-border judicial cooperation. The arbitral tribunal will issue an arbitral ladder to ask the court uh, that would have territorial competence over an issue to assist the tribunal in enforcing an interim decision um, and enforcing um, any, any necessary measures for the resolution of that dispute. Um, of course, this happens because tribunals do not naturally have a, an execution and enforcement power. Um, so they have to rely on the courts to do that. In a decision of August 2019, the SDJ confirmed the effectiveness of the arbitral letter. It's, uh, I, I gave a, an easier, let's say easier name to this case. It's the Kurumi Mine case. Um, it originated in Minas Gerais, my, my region. And the SDJ confirmed the effectiveness of the, of the use of the arbitral letter and also clarified the role of the courts in assisting arbitral tribunals. So in that decision, the SDJ confirmed that the courts will have limited powers when deciding on granting assistance, pursu assistance pursuant to the arbitral letter. So basically the SDJ found that while courts may be allowed to do a prima facie analysis of the validity of the letter to confirm it was rendered by a competent tribunal. So for example, they will look on a prima facie analysis whether the, the, all the documents are present, whether they are all the legal requirements are present. The court will not have competence to review the merits of the tribunal's decision of the interim measure, for example, that the tribunal has issued. This approach is actually very similar to the approach taken in Article 17, I think letters H and I of the ANSI trial model law. So this is yet another example of how um, uh, the ANSI trial model law has been inspired not only the Brazilian Arbitration Act, but in a certain sense, it inspires how courts apply the Brazilian Arbitration Act. Um, more importantly, I think in this case, the SDJ uh, found that the courts are able to exercise their enforcement powers in order to adequately support the arbitral tribunal, including vis-a-vis -vis third parties. So in that, in that case, the SDJ um, upheld the lower court's decision ordering a third party to allow claimants to have access to certain facilities and to certain information that were essential for the effectiveness of the arbitral tribunal's decision in the resolution of the dispute. So basically, although the tribunal issued a decision against the respondent so that the respondent gave access to claimants to this facility and to the information therein, when the court was enforcing that decision, the court found that it had to order a third party to allow the claimants to have access, and it did so. When the SDJ reviewed the decision, the SDJ agreed with the lower court and the SDJ did so because it understood that while the powers of the arbitral tribunals are limited to the parties of the arbitration, the powers of a court are not. And therefore, the trial courts um, may exercise their power over third parties if appropriate under the circumstances in order to give efficacy to the arbitral decision. So in this case, the court found that there, was, there would be no, um, no injuries, no excessive harm to the party that had control, to the third party that had control over the facilities, and therefore simply order them to allow claimants to have access to the information they needed. Well, the second uh, recent development, very briefly that I would like to mention here, is the SDG, SDJ's approach to the so-called conflict of competence. So under Brazilian law, uh, when there is a question regarding which lower court will have competence over an issue, the parties may, may ask the STJ, the superior court, to solve the conflict of, conflict of competence between those two trial courts. 
In recent years, the SDJ has consolidated the view that its powers to resolve the conflict of competence between these trial courts extends to the um, power to resolve a conflict between the jurisdiction of trial courts and arbitral tribunals. Interesting, um, in many cases, the parties have actually been relying on these, um, this approach by the STJ to decide on a conflict of competence. The parties have been re relying on that in the context of anti-arbitration suits. So a, com a very common scenario that we see in some of the decisions by the STJ is that of a party um, to an arbitration asking a lower court to order the stay of an arbitral proceeding. While the Brazilian lower courts generally respect the principle of competence, competence, in some cases, it may be that the lower court will decide and grant an anti-arbitration measure. When that happens, the opposing party then asks the STJ to decide on this conflict of competence. Um, overall, the STJ has been quite successful in using this type of proceeding with appropriate care and acknowledging the principle of competence, competence. So in many of these cases um, that concern um, arbitration, actually many of them are in the context of insolving, insolvency proceedings. Um, the SCJ has been clarifying the limits of the powers, for example, of the insolvency courts and the arbitral tribunals, while also confirming the perfect existence of the courts and tribunals in the Brazilian legal system. So basically in the examples that I just mentioned where there's an anti-suit um, arbitration, when the STJ finds that there is a valid clause um, or in a, on a prima facie analysis, there is a valid uh, arbitration clause and there is no issue as to the arbitrability of the dispute, then the STJ will respect the principle of competence, competence and uh, confirm that the arbitral tribunal will have jurisdiction instead of the lower court. Um, of course, in different cases, when there is no arbitrability, the STJ will grant the, the competence or jurisdiction to the trial court. So Carlos, I think those are the two main examples that I wanted to address. Um, and that's it. I, I think we can discuss more later. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the first part of, of your presentation. The second part, I will make a comment right? just uh, after my... Uh, my brands uh, uh, for you. Okay, thank you. It's very important to know to learn that uh, Brazilian courts support arbitration. There's no country that has developed its own uh, arbitration act uh, or proceedings without the supporting of the local courts. So it's very important. Uh, however, when you mention the conflict of competence, I may say that some of the uh, the professors and the law commentators here hate this conflict of competence as a solution for uh, the problems we have from time to time uh, between the procedural arbitration, the arbitral proceedings and the judicial proceedings. Uh, maybe it's not the best solution. We can, this one we can talk uh, for several hours. However, that's the reality in Brazil, that's what's happened. And that's why it's, it's important to learn uh, that uh, Brazil is a little bit different in some thing, uh, and equal in the other side. But uh, Luisa mentioned in her presentation about the New York Convention. So can you explain to us in this uh, court system, who is in charge of the international uh, awards? Of course. Um, so in, in this particular case, it will be the, the SDJ is usually the main court with, um, with the competence or the jurisdiction over the decision on the recognition of the arbitral award. So usually what will happen is one of the parties will ask the SDJ to recognize the award um, and then the SCJ will grant the exequatur of that decision. 
and the decision can then be enforced by the local court with um, a territorial competence over whatever matter or whatever party there is. So basically that's the structure. Just as a, as a brief note, of course, you asked just uh, who would have jurisdiction, but it's always good to mention that the SCJ have, has been doing a good job again at enforcing the New York Convention and its principles. Um, I think we're not gonna have a lot of time to discuss this, but there has, have been also some recent discussions about how the language of the Brazilian arbitration law in some circumstances may be even more favorable than the New York Convention in the enforcement of, of awards. And in those cases, the SDJ has also been using that more favorable approach, which is consistent with article, I think, seven of the New York Convention, where it says that when the, the local law is more favorable, then we may opt for that. So overall, it's a very good environment for the enforcement of awards as well. Thank you. Very good, very good. And Maria Claudia, how are you? Fine? Great. Maria Claudia, as you are in London, you are almost an English woman. Uh, what makes a good seat of arbitration? And Brazil, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, who is, which is the most beautiful city in all the world, uh, fits in this definition of a good seat of arbitration? Thank you, Carlos. And uh, I couldn't um, start without taking um, Kansas CBC for an invitation. It's a pleasure to be in Hong Kong today. Um, but yeah, going straight into, into the debate, I think that from, from this discussion and, and from what we heard from Luis and Pedro, we have seen that um, when, you, when we think about a good arbitration seat, I think that are, there are mainly four things that come to mind. So the first one is a good arbitration law. Even better if it is an UNCITRAL model law inspired. And as uh, Luisa explained very well, if, if we look at Brazil, it certainly takes this box. The Brazilian Arbitration Act is partially based on the UNCITRAL uh, model law and the 8080, uh, 88 Spanish Arbitration Act, but it is considered a very modern piece of legislation, particularly because um, it leaves plenty of space for party autonomy. But I would dare say that having a good arbitration law is not that determinant in being a good place of arbitration. And why do I say that? If we look at uh, London, for example, where I live, uh, according to the Queen Mary, um, the latest Queen Mary and White and K survey, uh, London is the favorite arbitration seat in the world. So 60 something percent of the participants voted for London as their preferred seat of arbitration. Now, if we look at the English Arbitration Act of 1996, we will see that it is far from being a good law by international standards. It is not inspired in the model law, and it has some rather um, sui generis provisions. And one of them, one of the provisions that come to, comes to mind, and, and, and a lot of people don't even realize that that exists, but under the English Arbitration Act, there is a possibility of appeal to English judges on points of English law, which sounds very scary when we are talking about arbitration and what we want is not to submit ourselves to judges in general. But the reality is that the vast majority of such appeals, they either um, do not succeed or the parties um, exclude this right to appeal on a point of English law in their contracts, uh, either expressly or by reference to the choice of an institutional rule. But then what makes London a good seat? And I think that we have to look at, you know, this handful of, of, of cities that are normally chosen as uh, the preferred seats of arbitration and try to understand what makes uh, this place is a, a good seat. With regards to London, I believe that it is actually the position adopted by the English courts, which is to interfere as little as possible with arbitration. And this um, is not just something that you know happened to be that way. It's not because English judges don't care about arbitration. I think it is quite the opposite. Uh, this seems to be a conscious uh, policy decision taken by a judicial 
judiciary system who um, is very aware of the role played by London in the arbitration system, and also who wants to protect that role. Um, and this becomes very clear when one reads, for example, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision in Halliburton versus Chubb dealing with the duty of disclosure in international arbitration. In that decision, which deals with a myriad of um, issues and is extremely interesting and important, the judges make it very clear that they are absolutely aware that whatever they decide will have an impact of, uh, on the role that London plays in the arbitration arena. So I think that the judiciary, the courts, um, it is not so much about what the law says. Of course, we need a good law to start with, but it's not, it, if we only have a good law, that doesn't mean anything if that law is not correctly applied. So it's not so much about what the law says, but about, about how the courts apply the law and whether um, the judiciary system is a system that embraces arbitration or not. So on that point, that uh, takes us to the second, uh, second quality of a good arbitration seat, which is a pro-arbitration in independent judiciary. So what does a good judiciary mean? Well, basically two things, again, um, a judiciary that will execute an arbitration agreement and abstain as much as possible from interfering in arbitration proceedings and a system that will facilitate the execution of arbitral awards and conforms to international standards when it comes to annulment of awards. Now, as was mentioned here, you know, we have the necessary legislative support in the Brazilian Arbitration Act, which uh, recognizes the positive and negative effect of competence competence, reflects the ground for annulment of awards foreseen in the model law, and adopt international standards for the recognition of foreign awards as per the New York Convention. So with that legislative support, Brazilian courts, as uh, very well explained by, by Pedro, they have generally proven sophisticated and independent enough to favor international arbitration seated in Brazil. And now a lot is said about, uh, you know, specialized courts, and that's normally used as a very powerful marketing tool by, you know, these international places of arbitration. Uh, you know, London, the favorite seat of arbitration in the world, has a specialized court. Paris, the second favorite arbitration is, uh, seat, also has one. But as, as Pedro also mentioned, Sao Paulo also has one. And to be fair, I believe that Sao Paulo has two specialized courts, which will ensure uniformity and harmonization in arbitration-related um, cases. Now, the third quality of a good arbitration seat is being a member, of course, of the New York Convention. The reasons for this are obvious. You know, the ultimate goal of any arbitration is to have an enforcement and an enforceable judgment. So if those judgments are not recognized as such in a given country, of course, this country will never be a player in the international arena. But again, no issue here since, as already mentioned, Brazil is a member of the New York Convention. Now, the fourth um, quality relates to more logistical aspects. You know, it's been said that the seat must have infrastructure, professional resources necessary for quick, efficient, and safe procedures. Of course, a place like Sao Paulo, for example, has a highly qualified, specialized, multilingual, and culturally diverse arbitration community with capability to conduct all types of arbitration. It has great infrastructure. Um, the CAM CCBC Hearing Center, for example, is really state of the art. And Sao Paulo is of course very connected. And a bonus is that when compared to other major arbitration center, centers, especially with the uh, currency conversion rates that we have at the moment, arbitration in Sao Paulo will certainly be a lot cheaper. So, I think that in a nutshell, Sao Paulo has all the qualities that make a good international arbitration seat. But of course, reputation is something that you create and it takes time to consolidate. But I think that we are seeing the results. When I was working at an international arbitration institution almost uh, 15 years ago, 
Brazil was one of the major users of, of um, ICC arbitration, but the preferred seat um, seemed to be Paris at the time. And we would see all these cases involving Brazilian parties with uh, the seat in Paris. Um, and if there was a foreign party involved, even through a local subsidiary, there was no discussion that the place of arbitration would be outside of Brazil. Now, I think that this has completely changed. So not only Brazil has internationally, internationally renowned uh, local arbitration institutions, which have an impressive caseload, um, as is the case of Kansas CBC. And I would imagine that the vast majority of Kansas CBC arbitrations are seated in Brazil. But I think that the paradigm in this regard has changed because nowadays, even if you have a non-Brazilian party or a foreign party act, acting through a local subsidiary, that arbitration, of course, when the object of the contract or the project is based in Brazil, there's always a Brazilian connection, but that arbitration will now almost invariably be seated in Brazil and the majority of them will be seated in Sao Paulo. So I think that the challenge for, for Sao Paulo in my view is to keep building on, on that reputation and become a regional hub for international arbitration. And I believe that there is absolutely no reason why uh, that should not be the case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Claudia. Uh, Luis, I have a comment on that. Yes, it's just a brief comment uh, in addition to what Maria Claudia just explained. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has a very interesting material called the Seat Index in which they explain specifically those points that Maria Claudia brought during her presentation and those seats that, well, the seats that they already have uh, listed there are the Hong Kong, London, New York, Paris, Singapore, and Switzerland. I think Sao Paulo, as I have already checked, would probably come next, but it's very interesting to check this material. So it's the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Seat Index because it explains point by point those advantages uh, a seat can bring that Maria Claudia explained. Uh, and because of that, I, I have to agree with Maria Claudia and she said that we have to create a reputation. And it's exactly that what we are doing and exactly that's what we are doing right now. Uh, when you have the opportunity to have this kind of webinar, we are trying to uh, look forward the future of arbitration in Brazil, the future of Brazil as a seat of arbitration. So thank you very much for both comments. It's very important. Before we go to the next topic, I think we have a question for the audience uh, from, uh, it was here, but I, I have here my cell phone. Uh, it's a question to Pedro. Uh, when it comes to arbitrability in the STJ control of conflict of competence, does the STJ make a prima facie analysis or it has a mechanism to limit its own control? It's a very important question. Uh, we're ready to answer, so please do it. I'll, I'll try as, as best as I can, <laughs> Carlos. Um, and thank you, Felipe, for, for the question. Um, I, my personal view, after having read some of the decisions recently, is that we're, um, Basically, the mechanism that we have here is the principle of competence competence. That's, that's, that's the underlying um, um, mechanism that we have in the Brazilian law that the STJ should consider when, um, when analyzing the arbitrability of an issue um, um, in the context of the conflicts of competence. That said, um, I would make the caveat that I think um, it's a very tenuous um, line to, to draw, right? Um, when, when am I making a prima facie analysis of the arbitrability of an issue? And when am I actually doing a full analysis of the arbitrability so that the parties can move forward or the arbitral tribunal can move forward? I tend to think, um, based on the decisions that I've read, that um, over time, the SDJ in particular, but courts in Brazil in general, have been 
getting closer to the ideal application of the competence competence principle in a sense that at least when the tribunal is already constituted, um, they will recognize the competence competence principle and say, let's, let's let them decide that. Not saying it's all the decisions uh, that they're gonna have this very um, cautious and distant approach, but I, I, I have a feeling based on the decisions that I've been reading that over time that has increased a lot. And the number of decisions in which the SDJ do a full analysis or enters into the analysis of the arbitrability um, in this kind of context, right, um, has decreased a lot, which shows a little bit of the um, a better understanding of the competence competence. And I think it's a result of how courts are getting more qualified to that. So that's my attempt to answer, Carlos. <laughs> is that, this is a very tough yeah, question. That, that's one of the very good answer. Uh, and with that, we, we, we have an overview of the Brazilian Arbitration Act. We have an overview how the courts in Brazil deals with the arbitration. So I think now is the time to talk a little bit about institutional arbitration. Uh, and no one better to do that than Luisa, who is in charge of the Kansas CBC. So, and I must say that Kansas CBC is the best well known institutional arbitration in Brazil, uh, the bigger, the major, the not only in Brazil, in South America, in America, all, all over the world. And so, Luisa, explain to us how Kansas CBC operates, how you do uh, the arbitration proceedings uh, that you are in charge. Thank you, Carlos. Yes, uh, as a representative of the Kansas CBC, it is always important to mention at the beginning what Carlos just said, that uh, we are in fact the largest and most traditional arbitration institution in the country and that we are responsible for administering near half of the Brazilian market of conflict arbitration proceedings. So, and as Maria Claudia mentioned uh, during her presentation, while the majority of cases at the Kemsa CBC are indeed considered domestic arbitrations, we are an international arbitration institution and we do have experience in cases involving parties, contracts and applicable law from different countries. So that includes China and, well, since we're in Hong Kong today, in, in my fictitious scenario, I'll just mention China. Um, arbitration, well, the Kimsa CBC, I guess, it grew together with arbitration in Brazil. And since we, heard, we had already mentioned that arbitration has become the preferred method of dispute resolution for international commercial disputes in the past years, the Kimsa CBC has also seen this increase in its cases. So the past uh, decade, we, we noticed uh, an absurd increase in almost 800% of the amount of new, case, new arbitration cases filed every year. And well, since I do work at an institution, let me, let me disclose as well that uh, as, an, as a representative, uh, the choice of institution arbitration uh, over an ad hoc proceeding, which is when the parties and the arbitrators organize the proceedings themselves without the support of a third party. And, and so the choice of a, an institution arbitra arbitrator arbitration in itself is a choice for a more effective arbitration proceeding. So that brings legal certainty, that brings cost certainty for the parties, and that's something that they are always looking for. Uh, in comparison, an, an, an ad hoc proceeding requires a lot more design and uh, cooperation between the parties. Otherwise, it just, uh, it, it, it's a very, it gets stuck. The, the parties will not evolve in that the discussions and that the proceedings themselves will be harmed and will not be as efficient, will not be as fast, as quick, and, and the dispute will not be resolved as uh, efficiently as possible. Uh, the Kemsa CBC, at the Kemsa CBC, well, besides offering the administrative support, we also uh, offer all of the financial assistance for the parties. And as already mentioned, also the infrastructure needed for an arbitration proceeding. And that includes arbitration hearing rooms when, well, of course, whenever we are in an in-person regular scenario, which currently does not happen. But what happens now is that we have 
both the virtual scenario. Well, we switched very quickly to the virtual scenario, so we adapted very quickly. And that is something that in an ad hoc proceeding you would not have. So this sort of uh, quick response and uh, flexibility, adaptability that the institution itself brings to the proceedings. So when the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke out uh, a year ago, we were completely adapted in less than a day. So we went from regular arbitration proceedings, uh, physical petitions, physical hearings, and then the next day we were all at home and everything was working perfectly well from the virtual, virtual venues. And so that is, I, I think that one of the greatest advantages that you can actually see in a time like this during this pandemic that you would not get from uh, an ad hoc proceeding. It, this would probably require a lot more, more uh, well, a lot more from the parties, period. And besides those, uh, those, offerings that, that I bring that uh, an arbitration institution brings the uh, the one of the advantages of using institutional arbitration uh, resorting to an institution such as the campus of CDC is that we also administer other other kinds of alternative dispute resolution so also mediation and dispute board etc and so you can more easily um, transit and go from one to the other and without spending as much money and also while benefiting from having a more appropriate type of a dispute resolution mechanism adopted to your case specifically. So for instance, uh, we offer advantages for when, when you file a mediation case prior to an arbitration case, we give a 100% discount in the arbitration, in, in our institutional fees, because to the institution that, that means that it's, it's our commitment that the parties get their dispute resolved in the best way possible. And if that means that they can resolve this dispute prior in a mediation case, which would be less costly and which would be a lot faster to them, then that's to us, that's what, what matters. That's what's most important. Um, what else? I think that the, at the Kimsey CBC, we have a very hands-on, uh, close approach because we do have case managers. So we have the, a, a large, very large secretariat. We have eight case managers and eight um, deputy case managers. So we have 16 young lawyers working at the secretariat and they follow the cases very closely, whether that is to, to offer support to arbitrators or to parties in case of questions or really anything throughout the entire proceedings from the moment you file the arbitration case to the moment that the, the arbitral award is actually uh, submitted to the parties. And that helps, that is one of the, the biggest uh, advantages of the CAMSA CBC that is deemed to be one of the, one of the greatest strengths that the CAMSA CBC has to offer in comparison to other institutions. So those young lawyers are all well, well prepared to always answer the questions of the arbitral tribunal and specifically to implement the rules which are set in the arbitration rules or the mediation rules because uh, otherwise it's in an ad hoc proceeding that that does not happen because they the parties and the arbitrators they just follow a set of rules and the arbitrator exercises their own jurisdiction but in, a, in an institutional um, arbitration the the case managers they are this front of the line people which ensure that the rules are applied and that the and the proceeding is not harmed by one of the parties or one of the arbitrators and that it can be conducted in the most effective manner so that the dispute gets resolved in a faster and most effective manner in general. Uh, so I guess that those were some of the initial considerations that I had. Well, the Kemp CBC there are also some aspects that I, I think I might uh, bring later on, but the Kimsa CBC does not have a, a court like the ITC. So the process of scrutiny, et cetera, that does not happen at the Kimsa CBC. It's different. It, it's more concentrated on the, on the president of the Kimsa CBC, 
And here we have a former president. So Mr. Carlos Forbes used to be the president and that the president makes all of the decisions regarding any administrative uh, issue that has to be dealt before the arbitral tribunal is formed. So, and, and those are a lot. <laughs> I mean, those are not very few cases, which one might think. Um, what else? The hearing centers, uh, so the this administrative support, one of all of, another difference that the Kemsa CBC brings to the table is that these hearing centers, uh, both the physical ones and the virtual ones, are offered to the parties for free. So that is something that the parties should also take into account because most in institutions they charge by the hour or for each time that you use their hearing center or their virtual venue. And that is something that we include in the administrative fee. So I guess, yes, those were the first comments that uh, I wanted to paint about the, the Kansas CBC. Thank you very much, Luis. And, and it's true, and I must highlight that the, the, the biggest the, the difference from Kansas CBC from the other uh, true institution that I know as an arbitrator is the case manager. The, uh, this, they are very important. They are training, they help a lot the arbitral tribunal, but they also help the parties, the lawyers, the firms that are taking care of their clients. And because of that, I will ask Pedro, um, how, uh, you are from clear gossip, you live in the United States, you are a man of the world. Uh, in your opinion, what is the general opinion of the foreign law firms and practitioners regarding the arbitration in Brazil? Sure. Um, so Carlos, first, I, I think I must uh, um, say I agree with um, what Maria Claudia has uh, brought to the table, in particular when she mentioned how uh, parties look um, at how the courts handle arbitration issues, um, even maybe even more so than how the law itself is written because the law may be interpreted in many different ways and the courts may react differently. Um, that said, I think generally the um, foreign, foreign firms like my firm, like uh, Cleary Gottlieb and um, foreign clients, I think they tend to see Brazil as an arbitration friendly jurisdiction. Um, generally, that's the case generally. And I, I wanna give you an example that it's a, let's say an outlier. I have a client that for several unfortunate reasons um, has been having a hard time trusting Brazilian courts to decide on, on its disputes. Um, despite that concern that this client, this particular client has, the client is still confident um, in how Brazil courts, Brazilian courts respect arbitration. And therefore, like this client, although that uh, it has difficulty in trusting courts for deciding on the merits of, their, of, of this client's disputes, this client still agrees to jurisdiction to arbitration with a seat in Brazil. Uh, we, we just recently wrapped up an arbitration with this client that had a seat in Sao Paulo, and the client was perfectly satisfied with the results of how the arbitration has been handled. Um, so I wanted to mention this example because even when in, in the few circumstances, a client of mine has expressed some concern with Brazilian courts and this client has its very particular reasons um, for thinking that, um, even in that case, that concern did not extend itself to arbitration in Brazil and how the courts handle arbitration in Brazil. And that to me uh, was a very, a fine example and a very clear example of how um, our clients stand to see arbitration in Brazil and, and our firm can continue to see Brazil as an arbitration friendly jurisdiction. Um, that said, I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of other aspects. I think uh, um, either Luisa or Maria Claudia may have mentioned this a little bit, but of course, besides the law, besides the court, the arbitral community is another thing that will uh, clients and firms will take into account. Um, and first, I think there are highly qualified Brazilian professionals that act as arbitrators in Brazil. 
um, many of whom are also often involved in complex international proceedings. We also have um, Brazilian arbitrators that are not necessarily being arbitrated in Brazilian cases. So there are also arbitrators in investment cases. Uh, and, and I think this goes to showing how these professionals have been acting as arbitrators are highly qualified and knowledgeable on the state of the art practices of international arbitration. Um, sometimes um, for foreign clients though, that will not be enough in terms of, let's say a Brazilian being a good arbitrator. Um, clients may be interested, for example, in having a more, let's say, independent arbitrator in the tribunal. So for example, a foreign client may be interested in having uh, someone that is not a Brazilian national in an arbitration. In many cases, even in arbitrations that are in English, one thing that at least uh, um, as a lawyer, I would tend to think this, and, and my teams also think this, it's desirable, to have, it's desirable to have someone that will have at least some Portuguese language skills, or at least some knowledge of how Brazil works when you have a Brazilian related dispute. And fortunately, if that is the case, if we get to that very narrow exception where the client's looking for someone that is not a Brazilian national, we still want someone that, um, understands a little bit of Portuguese or at least has some knowledge of how Brazil works, um, we also have, I think, a wide range of foreigners who are fluent in Portuguese and quite acquainted with the Brazilian context. So um, I wanted to highlight that because it's not always about having the Brazilians knowing arbitration, but also having others that are acquainted with the jurisdiction that, um, that can act as arbitrators. Um, just recently, I, I was in an arbitration that was actually bilingual. So the arbitration was held in English, but the parties had agreed in the contract that evidence could be submitted in Portuguese without translations, including witness testimony. So in that case, um, our client really wanted um, at least someone that was a little bit more neutral. I think the other side agreed to that. And in the end, we ended up with um, two Brazilian co-op traders that were renowned in Brazil and the foreign chair who speaks Portuguese perfectly um, and is very acquainted and has worked in many cases. So that was a very, very interesting uh, point. And finally, uh, just to wrap this, uh, this point a little bit, um, the same goes to the rest of the community. So we're talking about first as op traders. Now we have the same with um, firms and experts in Brazil. So giving a perspective from, from Cleary, from Cleary Gottlieb, we as a foreign international slash international firm, we're not allowed to practice Brazilian law in Brazil due to local bar regulations. As a consequence, in cases related to Brazil, so when example, there is a, a, a Brazilian law element, um, we are either going to partner with a local firm or we're going to engage an expert witness. It will usually depend a little bit on the level of, you know, on the volume of Brazilian law related issues that we're gonna have in a case. Um, so just to distinguish here, a very brief example, we had a case that was a contract under Swiss law. Um, it was with um, um, a Geneva um, seed, uh, no, Zurich seed, I think. And we um, ended up having this huge dispute under Swiss law, the huge contract that was a small part of the contract that referred to Brazilian regulations. And because of that, we ended up engaging several Brazilian experts, both sides, to discuss those issues. And it was very interesting and very good to work with them. So um, I just wanted to point that out, that local lawyers and experts are extremely well prepared and acquainted with international practices. And it has been a pleasure to work with them in, in many proceedings. And of course, uh, just reinforcing Lisa's point um, and everyone's point here, the institutions are equally excellent. Comes to CBC is a perfect example of that. So, so that, that's, that's what I think um, we uh, as a firm and our clients will look for uh, Carlos when we're looking at Brazil. Thank you, I, I totally agree with you. I think exactly that. Uh... And I really understand that we cannot work in a sign of our uh, uh, legal uh, location uh, without help. And of course, the foreign firms must think that, oh, no, I'll go to uh, Brazil and no one 
we we'll talk with me, and we don't have the, 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 the people looking for that. No, but we are. In Brazil, I really think that they want to be an international rep for arbitration, not only in South America, but uh, among the countries around the world where we're not, we have a, a, a place that uh, uh, support the arbitration with not only the treasurers, but the group staff, the, the whole arbitration com community, as you mentioned. But there's, there's, there's a problem that everybody talks about uh, in Brazil, investment arbitration. Uh, as the participants must know here, Brazil is not, uh, there are two or three uh, bits, but it doesn't work. But it doesn't really doesn't work. Maria Claudia, uh, could you explain a little bit why Brazil do not uh, execute any investment, uh, uh, investment agreement with arbitration clause? And uh, different or the commercial arbitration Brazil substitutes the investment arbitration. Um, I guess the short answer would be yes, but I will try to to, to develop um, a little bit more on that. So uh, as you know, as you all know, and um, uh, Carlos mentioned, Brazil never ratified any international investment agreement containing investor state arbitration clauses. And contrary to the majority of um, its Latin American neighbors, Brazil was not or is not a party to um, the Washington Convention. Now, Brazil did sign some 14 BITs back in the 90s, but it never ratified them. And the reasons that have been traditionally given for this is that, well, until the early 2000s, there was a still there were still doubts, you know, uh, regarding the constitutionality of the submission of the Brazilian state and state entities to arbitration. And also the fact that Brazil was always able to maintain its attractiveness to investments without the need to submit itself to the investor state arbitration system. So, you know, in a nutshell, Brazil always consistently ranks amongst, you know, the top 10 recipients of uh, foreign direct investments worldwide. So that was mainly the reason why. But, but Brazil, Brazil's position has, um, has always been seen, especially by the international community, as, you know, isolated and, and against the international trend. And I, I, I always say that uh, Brazil was this kind of stubborn kid that would not really submit to what was internationally seen as um, the normal way of, of deciding disputes between states and foreign investors, but also, as I mentioned, a very spoiled kid, because indeed it seems that for a country like Brazil, investment uh, agreements were never determinant to attract foreign investments. So Brazil was able to simply snob the system, basically. Now this changed slightly around 2015 when Brazil started signing some cooperation and facilitation investment agreements with a handful of uh, basically African and Latin American countries. And then in 2016, it signed a broader economic and trade agreement with Peru that contained, uh, contained similar provisions with regards to investments that this um, cooperation and facilitation agreement. And then uh, Brazil entered into a trend of signing this kind of agreement. In 2017, it signed the protocol on cooperation and facilitation of intra-Mercosur investments. So for those who don't know, Mercosur is a multilateral uh, agreement that uh, involves Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Um, and then in 2018 and 19, it kept signing similar agreements with other African Latin American states, uh, the UAE, and last year it signed a similar agreement with India. Now these agreements, they do not constitute a change of heart with regards to Brazil's policy, uh, consistent to uh, Brazil's historical position against investor state arbitration, 
these investment agreements, they, they try to provide an alternative institutional model for prevention and settlement of disputes, but they do not contain investor state arbitration. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail about this specific agreements, but I think it's worth mentioning that with regards to dispute resolution provisions, these agreements, they create a binary system of, on the one hand, uh, a dispute, dispute avoidance mechanism and a resolution provisions, but that is through state to state arbitration. So there's never investor state arbitration involved. Now, while traditional uh, BATs have as a central aspect uh, the, the settlement of investor uh, state disputes through investor state arbitration, the, the Brazilian proposal, which was um, not entirely created by Brazil, but inspired by what South Korea was doing at the time, the Brazilian proposal privileges dispute prevention mechanisms based on dialogue and bilateral uh, consultations prior to the installation of an arbitration procedure, which is commendable. And I think that it's fair to say that Brazil is in the, in the vanguard of um, investor state disputes prevention. However, with respect to the dispute resolution mechanism, the fact is that investment arbitration is simply not open to foreign investors seeking protection of their investments in Brazil. Now, Brazil's absence from the investment arbitration system does not mean that foreign investments are not protected in the country. After um, the enactment of the Brazilian Arbitration Act in 96, you know, Brazil ratified all the main international conventions on arbitration, including, as we already mentioned, you know, the, the, the New York Convention, and it enacted specific legislation that allows the arbitration of disputes with the state. And we have a bunch of them, and I will, I will, I will cite a couple of them, like um, the concessions law of 95, the telecommunications law of 97, the petroleum law, I think also 97, the electricity sector law, and the famous public-private partnership law of 2004, amongst others. Now, in addition, with the reform of the Arbitration Act in 2015, the state of uh, the positive law at the time, which, as I mentioned, you know, by the enactment of all of these specific legislations meant that there was no doubt that the state and state entities could submit themselves to arbitration. But that reality was reflected in the new law that expressly recognized the possibility of the public administration to enter into arbitration agreements. So uh, in a nutshell, arbitration with the state and state entities in Brazil is a reality. And I would dare to say that it's not only a reality, but it's common business. It is how state entities and investors, and be it domestic or foreign investors, resolve their disputes. I think that nowadays in Brazil, in all of the major infrastructure projects, uh, contracts, you will have arbitration clauses. And I think that what is peculiar and interesting and important to note is that in Brazil, the state is not submitting itself to arbitration with foreign investors only, you know, because they would fear that if they don't, they couldn't attract investments. That's not the, the, the rationale behind it at all. The state is arbitrating its disputes with the domestic contractor and concessionaire as well. So I think that going back to the, the original question, did Brazil replace uh, in the investment arbitration system by incentivizing commercial arbitration between foreign investor and uh, state-owned entities? And I think the, 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 the answer is definitely yes, it has. Um, and I think that at a time in which the investment arbitration regime is being heavily attacked by critics, and we have seen in recent years, you know, several countries, uh, mainly in Latin America, denouncing the Washington Convention. In Europe, we have seen the consequences of the ECMIA decision, which basically means that there's no more intra-European investor state arbitration anymore. And we have the UNCITRAL working group three looking at ways to improve and reform 
investment arbitration. I think that, you know, the, the current reality is that um, investment arbitration regime is in a, a transitional moment and may evolve into something considerably different uh, than what we know today. So maybe again, we could consider that despite the choices made um, in this Brazilian cooperation and facilitation agreements, uh, given Brazil's strong embrace of commercial arbitration with state-owned entities, I think that Brazil is again in, in the vanguard in, the, in this regard. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, Maria Claudio. There's a question that I, I think that's already uh, answered by you, um, but maybe I, I can help a little bit with that. I'm going to read to you. Why do Brazilian protectionists dislike investment arbitration so much? Why strongly support commercial arbitration with Brazilian state-owned entities? What is the difference? I think they um, explain very well the difference. But I have learned from a friend of our here, Jose Emilio Nunes Pinto, uh, the answer for why do not, do not Brazil uh, execute any uh, BIT? Because we don't need it. Uh, according to the Brazilian law, uh, it's forbidden to make any kind of difference between local investment and foreign investment. So from Brazil perspective, both investments is, must be treated exactly the same way. So the BIT and the, the, the idea is, no, no, we have to protect the foreign investment, we have to create uh, some rules specific. And then the, the next step was to create the investment arbitration rules. Uh, any comments on that? Do you agree with me? With me? No. Do you agree with Jose Emilio Munoz Pinto or not? No, I, I, I do agree. I think that, I mean, the, the first, uh, again, the first reason is simply Brazil doesn't need it. Brazil never needed investment um, arbitration to attract foreign invest, investments. But also Brazil has no history, as, as you pointed out, has no history of treating uh, aliens, you know, in a, in a different way. Brazil yeah. has very strong institutions. Brazil has a very strong tr tradition with commercial arbitration. So those mainly are, are, are the reasons. I mean, a foreign investor will not uh, um, refrain from investing in Brazil because they don't have access to investor state arbitration. They, they will just structure their investment in a different way. So first you need a contract. So it's true that you know, Brazil does not uh, uh, give this broad protection of foreign investors through BITs, which means you can simply go to a country do something, have no contract with any, you know, state entity and still be able to sue the country if something goes wrong with your investment. That will not happen in Brazil, but the reality is that, you know, most of the big investment projects are done in, in, in our structure through contracts in any event. Um, so you will just, any foreign investor will simply go to Brazil knowing that uh, they have to structure their investment in a way that you know they will have recourse against the state against the state entity so you know the short answer and i don't think i think the question say why brazilian practitioners don't like investment in state uh, i don't think it's a matter of brazilian practitioners i mean i'm a brazilian practitioner i've done uh, investor state arbitration for 10 years uh, not with Brazil, of course, but I always liked very much. Pedro mentioned we have a couple of Brazilians that have sat as, you know, arbitrators in, in investor state arbitrations. So it's just, I mean, the short answer has always been Brazil doesn't need it. Very well, very well. Thank you. Well, we, uh, before uh, we work to the end of the panel. And there is a final question here from Deborah Essi. Uh, what is the real importance of the seat of arbitration considering the recent transition, transition to electronic proceedings in virtual reading, hearings? Uh, who wanna answer that? Okay, so I answered. Uh, okay. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> it's still very important because uh, 
everything that Luisa Maria Claudia and Pedro answered, uh, just uh, let us understand that the seat of arbitration is important because you have several rules around the arbitration proceedings, around the arbitral tribunal, around the, 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 how courts face the arbitration. That is still important. So the seat of arbitration, not only the location, is the place where the arbitration and the rules around it will be uh, taking place. So it's still very important. Can I just um, add something, Carlos? There, so I think that in, a, in recently we have seen this um, trend and in, in people that like to talk about arbitration being this transnational procedure that somehow floats in the air that we are all super international. But at the end of the day, you have a judgment, a judgment that you need to enforce, and the court of the seat is where where you will try to annul this judgment uh, if, if you have grounds uh, for that. So if after an arbitration, uh, your judgment is annulled, you have nothing. Oh. And, and here we are not talking about, you know, this is not philosophy. This is not a, a bunch of people that like to travel the world. This is, you know, we are solving disputes. And at the end of the day, someone needs to enforce that decision. So, you know, I think it's very nice to talk about this transnational, super international aspect, but at the end of the day, invariably, an award is always attached to a seat. It has to be attached to a seat because you need enforcement and you need annulment. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, just one uh, correction that uh, uh, all the British community wants to travel around the world. That, that's true. <laughs> we want to do that. Uh, okay, <laughs> we, are, we are going to the end. And of we the can't work. stand this pandemic anymore because we cannot yeah. travel. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, let's uh, starting by uh, Louisa. Uh, Louisa, what do you think about the future of uh, arbitration in Brazil, and what we are doing to to achieve this future? I'm going to ask Maria Claudia and Pedro the same thing, okay? So you can think uh, 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 at the end of the Louisa question. Thank you, Carlos. Yes, well, I think that the, the success of arbitration and so the future of arbitration, the development of arbitration is very often intertwined with the promotion of arbitration itself as a dispute resolution mechanism and therefore advertising the method of arbitration itself is important, is an important step for, because many lawyers are not familiar yet with alternative, alternative dispute me mechanisms, whether in Brazil or in, in the international scenario. So, uh, I mean, businessmen everywhere, they, they still need to hear about arbitration and how it works, why it works so well. In Brazil, I think that we have a few advantage uh, points that I'm going to share. So the first one would be the Brazilian Arbitration Committee, the CBAR. The CBAR does a fantastic job at, at that kind of promotion. It has been standing strong for eight, 20 years now, and it organizes important initiatives which go beyond the institutional promotion. It has an active role in indeed following legislative works related to ADRs. Another one would be uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So the CARB is a world renowned institute, very well regarded by the arbitration community. And they recently opened just a couple of years ago, a Brazilian branch here. And so that goes to show both the level of development of Brazil in the field of arbitration, as well as how well prepared and well trained and experienced both Brazilian arbitrators and Brazilian lawyers are. Uh, the KMC CBC, well, I cannot not speak about the KMC CBC. The KMC CBC has taken the lead in many projects and initiatives such as this. Uh, and one of those would be the arbitration in Sao Paulo. So we at the KMC CBC have jointly with three other Brazilian arbitration institutions developed a sort of uh, pamphlet in which we, we then transformed it into a website, which is arbitrationsaopaulo.org.br. And it contains the main information one would need to know when considering the inclusion of Sao Paulo as a seat of arbitration. So that's a very important um, point for you. 
the, the next one would be Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Arbitration Week, which was of course suggested by yours truly, Mr. Carlos Forbes. The first informal edition was in 2017. And due to its astounding success, we decided to formalize it. And then we, we officially began in 2018. But this past year, it was done virtually because of the whole pandemic situation. But there were still many events and interesting opportunities for academic discussions and for networking. Uh, I believe that 2021 is going to follow the same format, unfortunately. But hopefully next year, we can all be together and just gather the international community. For those of you who are interested, we also have a website, which is sparbitrationweek.com.br. And it's, it's meant to be a collaborative calendar in which you may simply register your event. So your workshop, your Congress, whatever that is, and it will be featured as a part of the official Sao Paulo Arbitration Week. Final two remarks. Uh, I cannot also not speak about the Sao Paulo Premier. We had that uh, a couple of weeks ago. The Sao Paulo Premier, we've been organizing it for over 12 years now. And besides teams from all regions in Brazil, we've already welcomed, welcomed students from Germany, France, the United States, Argentina, Japan, Uruguay, etc. And this year was actually, uh, we had a record amount of registered teams. We had over 70 people, 70, 70 teams which wanted to, well, that, that was chaotic. We, we could not accept 70 teams, but we ended up with 40 teams. And it was a very interesting, uh, a very interesting experience for us because last year we had the Premier was actually the last, one of the last uh, in-person events that we had. So for many students last year, the, the Sao Paulo Premier became the competition itself because it was the last opportunity that they had to compete in person and to have that exchange with other, other students and with the arbitrators themselves, which is one of the most, one of the important aspects of the business. Uh, but this year we had it virtually and hopefully next year, we'll see if it's going to have to be virtual or not. Uh, last but not least, I would like to mention New Gen, New Generation, which is the CAMSA CBC Commission of Young Practitioners in the field of arbitration. Pedro here is in the steering committee. In one year, we already engaged far more than 300 young lawyers and students into promoting arbitration. So if that is the case, please join us and learn more about arbitration in general, but also about the Brazilian arbitration community. And thank you. Thank you, Luisa. Uh, Pedro, your final words about the future of arbitration in Brazil. Um, that's a tough question, Carlos. Um, just trying in, in a couple of minutes. You're moving or uh, you're going to stay here in Brazil? That, that, that's the important question. Or oh, that's the answer for my question. Uh, what, what did you say again? Sorry. You are moving from Brazil or going to stay here with us? No, uh, I'm, that, that is <laughs> I'm, um, I'm going question. to stay. I actually, I actually, um, I'm actually staying. I would say the, um, for the future, I think, and I, and I would like to focus a little bit on, on a particular issue, but um, I think now we definitely have a very solid arbitration practice. We have a solid law, we have a solid uh, application by the courts, we have a solid community, and that's great. Um, it means we're reaching a, a very good level. Um, but as that happens, we start to see the potential of arbitration for several different areas that were not traditionally um, within arbitration. And I think as that happens, um, we will need uh, as a community to properly develop the rules and understand to what extent we can expand into those areas. And in certain cases, we may want to clarify more specific rules for different types of arbitrations, not necessarily in the law, but at least in certain types of procedures. And I'm thinking in particular here about um, arbitrations related to securities. Um, bonds in particular, and I think that's the capital markets notion uh, of arbitration. Um, as many of you may know, we've been having um, a, a series of what we call like a collective or class arbitrations um, in, in, in Brazil. 
And part of that is because, uh, I don't know if you're acquainted with this, but because we have a, a system in the US for securities litigation, they have the class actions where the investors go and they are able to sue the companies for um, misstatements and misleading statements. And um, there's a decision there called Morrison, um, recent decision that limited the number of investors that can bring suits um, under the class action in the US. So when that happens, many of them, when they are seeking damages against Brazilian companies are now coming to Brazil. And in Brazil, we have usually arbitration clauses in the, um, in the uh, bylaws of the companies. So I think that's an area that is developing a lot. I think that's where we need to look more um, particularly for uh, in the future. Great. And Maria Claudia, what do you think about it? I think a little bit in um, line in line with what Pedro was was saying, but more more generally, maybe I think that arbitration, not only in Brazil, arbitration in general is a very fragile system. Um, you know, arbitration exists because a bunch of countries decided that they were okay with giving up their monopoly on the adjudication of decisions to private individuals and they accept that those judgments um, are enforceable. But um, so the, the survival of arbitration rests on the trust that people have in, in the system. And I think that um, arbitration needs something that needs, and I, I, I remember reading once an article from, I think it was Jose Emilio saying that uh, arbitration needs uh, protection. And we as, um, practitioners of arbitration, we need to protect the system. So I think that the great ally and, and the great tool that Brazil has is, as mentioned by, um, by Luisa, the CBAR, because uh, they are extremely active, they are extremely vigilant um, and, and quick in reacting. So from time to time, we will see that odd decision coming along. We will see maybe, you know, a, a project of law trying to be approved in Congress that would change things a little bit, that would give weird names to, or would call arbitration things that are not. And, and the CBAR is always very protective of, of, of the institution in Brazil. And I think that that is a great, uh, again, a great ally that, that Brazilian uh, arbitration has, you know, the, and when I mentioned the CBAR, I mentioned basically the entire Brazilian arbitration community, you know, it's a very active community, a community that values uh, the integrity of the system, and I think that because of that, you know, arbitration in Brazil will be a reality for, for, for a long time to come, but it's up to us to protect that system. Very nice, thank you very much. We are, we are just on time. But I take the, the last words of uh, Maria Claudia to talk about about CIBAR, the Brazilian Arbitration Commission. Uh, to 2021 is the 20th uh, anniversary. And uh, as you may know, the Brazilian Arbitration Act was enacted in 1996. But until 2001, when we had the, the, the final judgment of the Supreme Court of Brazil, uh, saying that our, our Arbitration Act is constitutional. Everything's changed, changed for the first time. Now they learn, the people learn that they can use arbitration in Brazil. In this moment, the CBAR was created and the people say, okay, we have a law, but we have no arbitration or we start to think about arbitration. Let's take Congress. Let's uh, uh, support uh, young initiatives. Let's take part of uh, international events. And that works, 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 works. And I remember in 2010, when we have ICA Rio, uh, it was uh, uh, an event to support by Council CBC, to, uh, adopted by CBA. And that was the second time that everything changed since ICA. Rio in 2010, we became an uh, international seat for arbitration. And the people start to talk about Brazil, and the people start to talk about us, the people start to talk about you, the ISMUT, the VISMUT, uh, the people talk about the institution. So in my opinion, and I'm gonna end this webinar with that, 
the future of arbitration in Brazil, but in the world, will be brilliant. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I'm going to stay here and say bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. bye.